It's a weird world. Amen? Can I get an amen? Some of you don't know it because you didn't live in the world before this world, but if you lived in the world before this world, come on, the older people got to come with me. It's the world's getting weird. I mean, I'll give you one example. Video games have become such a dominant part of our world. Any gamers in the house tonight? Just see a show of hands. Six, see how dominant it is? Six people are gaming. It's just taken over. It's like wildfire. It's an epidemic for the six people here tonight uh, who will get what I'm about to say. But it's interesting that the gaming world is just one factor that we're all living with in this new world has made it a reality that a lot of people under 30 have spent more time interacting with people on screens, characters on screens, than they have interacting with real life people in real life situations. And it's growing faster than you and I can imagine. I was stunned to find out just recently that the Fortnite world champion, 16 year old from Pennsylvania, won $3 million for winning the Fortnite World Championship in July. That's more money than Rafa Nadal won for winning Wimbledon in July. Some of you are going, what is Fortnite? Exactly. (laughs) Fortnite came on the scene in 2017. It's grown so fast, it's made its parent company a $15 billion company. And half the people in this room don't even know what Fortnite is. The other half are going to go home and play Fortnite tonight, (laughs) and they're going to get their skills sharpened knowing that there's a $3 million (laughs) prize for winning the Fortnite World Championship. Scientists tell us, and we would have to agree, that we are addicted to technology. And scientists tell us that our relational skills are dwindling. Families are splitting up. Kids are left to fend for themselves and grow up far faster than in the generations before. Anxiety has exceeded almost every family table. Kids live in a fishbowl of comparison. And even if you wanted to, you cannot escape a world that bullies anyone and everyone it sees fit to do so. So it's no wonder when you read study after study after study that teens and young people in their 20s are battling depression at unprecedented rates. It's a reality. It's complex. Depression is complex. Mental illness is complex. But it's here, and it's in all of our lives. And if you are in the middle of this storm, you already know that's true. I want to make sure we say tonight that mental illness is not a one-size-fits-all problem. Mental illness happens for a lot of different reasons. It happens because of trauma in our lives. It happens because of genetic circumstances in our life. It happens because of chemical imbalances in our life. It happens because of stress in our lives, external circumstances in our life. Mental illness sometimes is a result of our own personal failures that we're trying to keep the world from knowing about. A lot of things can cause mental illness. And the problem with mental illness, one of the great frustrations of mental illness is you can't see it and you can't touch it. A scientist can't show it to you on a sonogram or an MRI or a CAT scan or a blood test that there are symptoms for sure that you can see, but you can't see mental illness. And that makes it even more frustrating for people who are fighting and struggling against it. And so obviously there's no three-step formula, right? There's no simple answer. There's no Band-Aid. And that's why I'm not going to try to give a lot of quips tonight. And I'm not going to try to offer any uh, one-size-fits-all solution tonight. I, on the other hand, uh, even as a believer in Jesus Christ, want to respect the force of mental illness. It has the power to steal and to kill and to destroy And I believe that the church is only going to be able to get into the conversation in the way that we need to once the church wakes up and understands the power of the grip of darkness that people are struggling with 
and facing in their lives. We can't just push it aside. We can't just say, oh, you can get over that. We can't just give a simple little bumper sticker size answer to people. We've got to respect that we are talking about a powerful force when we talk about mental illness. But I'm telling you, the thing that we've got to do is talk about it. And so tonight, whether it's suicide or whether it's depression or whether it's crippling anxiety, we're not going to hide in the uncomfortable, but we're going to point to Jesus tonight because he has triumphed over all. But we're also going to try to understand. If you haven't been through all this, I'm telling you right now, you probably don't fully understand it. That's not a knock on you. It's just a reality that you've got to step into. If you haven't had suicidal thoughts, then I'm just telling you, you can't fully understand. That's not a knock on you. It's just a reality that you have to step into. I don't really fully understand what that battle would look like. And even those of us who have been through severe depression, like myself, we don't even fully understand what we've been through. But not understanding isn't going to give us an out to be silent. We're not going to go silently. No, we're going to stand up and speak up. And tonight, we are shining a light into the darkness, even a darkness that maybe we don't fully understand because we do understand Jesus. And Jesus is the light in the darkness. Depression does its work, its best work in the dark. And I believe the power of depression Even the power of suicide garners its strength in the darkness. Scientists say that more suicides happen in the window of midnight than at any other time in the day. And I believe it's like a storm over ocean waters strengthening in the warmest of seas. That depression and anxiety and suicide, they strengthen in that dark night of hopelessness when we feel like maybe we're never going to see a dawn again. I know personally that depression tightens its grip in the night and in loneliness and in isolation. And tonight, all of us have the opportunity to step out of the night and into light, to step out of the isolation that can be depression and into community where we can be honest about who we are and what we're struggling with. And in stepping into the light, something can change. I am not a doctor. I am not an expert. I am not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist, but I've been down in the pit of depression. Most everybody in this church knows this, but I will say it again. I've been down in the place where lies incubate. I've been down in the place where I never thought I was going to be myself again. I've been down in the place where I thought I was losing my mind. And if you've been there, you can relate. And, if, if, and I can relate to you. I'm not talking about the lose my mind that we use just colloquially in our uh, given circumstances. Like, man, I lost my keys and I was late to work and I was losing my mind. Not that kind of losing my mind. I mean the real kind of losing your mind where you're like, I don't know what's happening to me right now. I'm not in full control of my faculties right now. Things are going on in my mind and physiologically in my body that I don't have control of right now. And I think I actually may be crazy. I have been in that place where hope seems to be extinguished. But I'm telling you, and I'll say it a thousand times, with the help of doctors and with Jesus and with the weapon of worship, I made it back to the land of the living. And by the grace of God, I'm standing here right now. And I know that what I needed in those months was not someone to come along and give me a shout out. Louis, you got this. You can do it. That is not what I needed in the darkness. And it is not what I needed deep down in that pit. I didn't need a shout out. I needed someone to show up and say, I have lived through what you have lived through and I'm here to tell about it. And God sent someone to me 
who had lived through exactly what I was going through and had lived to tell about it. I needed somebody to show up and say, you're not alone and you're not the only one because I didn't know that the world of mental illness existed the way it did until I was mentally ill and then I realized half the world is mentally ill. But if you don't know that already, you think you're the only one going through what you're going through, and you don't need a shout out saying you can do it. You need somebody to show up and say, hey, let me explain to you that you're not the only person going through this. And I'll tell you what else I needed. I needed somebody to show up, and they did show up, and they said, hey, this is going to be a bumpy ride, but you're going to get through this, and you are going to make it to the other side. I needed ultimately a miracle from God, and I ultimately got a miracle from God, and therefore, here I stand tonight, and I'm, in a way, uh, never wanting to go through that kind of depression again. But on the other hand, I'm so glad that I'm standing here as a result of it, because I would probably never be giving this talk if I hadn't. And I would never be able to have compassion for people who are struggling the way that I think that I can. And so I'm here tonight, if you're in that place, not to offer you something simple, and I'm not here to shout you out tonight and say, come on, you can do it. I'm here to tell you that you are not alone, and I'm here to tell you that you are going to make it through this by the grace of God. He is bigger than what you are facing. I'm here tonight to take depression seriously. I believe depression is real, and it is a killer but it is not bigger than Jesus. It is not bigger than Jesus. Now, if you're in panic right now, if you feel suffocated right now by thoughts of suicide, I want you to know you're not alone in this room, probably in your section, and very likely on your row. And I want you to know this, you're not crazy. No, you're not crazy. There may be a boatload of crazy in it. There was some crazy in mine. But you are not crazy. You are God's handiwork. And he is greater. You can clap for that if you want. Don't let people stop you if you want to get started. Don't you hate it when you want to clap and nobody else does and then you feel the pressure and then you just stop? Don't stop. Just keep going and let them feel the pressure of why am I not excited about the truth that's being proclaimed and the gospel that's being preached and the Jesus that's being exalted. Can you receive that tonight? You're not crazy. And you're like, well, you should see the symptoms I'm having. You should see the thoughts I'm having. You should see the things that my body's doing. Oh, I've seen all that before. And that's why I say there is crazy in it, but you are not crazy. God created you. And you are God's handiwork. One other thing I just want you to know tonight, we're here. We all showed up today. We all knew what this talk was about. We all knew what this subject matter was going to be today. And look around. We all showed up tonight. We didn't run and say, hey, you should go to that thing. We all came to this thing tonight. We're here. The church is here. But we need a few things to change. Number one, we need to talk about mental illness more. The church needs to talk about depression more. The church needs to talk about suicide more. And honestly, we don't have... A choice. There was a time where we didn't talk about it. I don't know if you remember that or not, but there was a time when someone would take their life and we would go to the service. I've been to services like this and no one ever mentioned that they took their life. They died. Never said how they died. Nobody ever talked about the circumstances in which they died, except in the hush conversations in the hallway. But we didn't want to talk about suicide. We didn't want to surface the reality Maybe a family member went to the psych ward and we just said, oh, they're they're dealing with an illness right now, or they went to the hospital. We never mentioned it was a mental hospital, or maybe someone we loved was out of commission because of depression. We said, yeah, they're going through a tough season right now, but we didn't want to tell people, oh, the reality is they're curled up in the fetal position at the house and they haven't moved in six weeks. But that was the reality. 
And I just hope that the church can get to a place where we can talk about it, where people don't feel like they have to hide what's going on in their world. I know for me, living in this PC world we live in, I felt like it was easier for me to say to people after the fact I had a panic disorder or an anxiety attack, because those actually kind of sound like you know something you have. Like I had a sinus infection, I had a panic disorder, uh, I pulled a muscle on my back, I, I had a, uh, an anxiety attack. It, it sounded so much more acceptable to people than saying, I had a mental breakdown. When's the last time you heard someone say that? Wow. Not any time recently. Because that doesn't float in the society as easily as I had a panic attack. And I just think we've got to strip all of the pretense away so that we can talk about reality. And one of the realities going on around us is massive depression, mental illness everywhere. Thoughts of suicide and suicide is happening everywhere, and the church needs to talk about it more. I think the days of not talking about it are over. Suicide, as you know, is one of, if not the fastest growing killer of young people, growing at an incredibly steady pace, especially among teens and people in their 20s. But it's not just young people. They say the most likely people to take their life are men and women over 70 years old. It's predominantly a white problem, specifically a white male problem. Seven in 10 people who take their life are white men. Uh, The most clarifying numbers we have looking back, 2017, and I didn't want to round the number I just wanted to give it in its detail to count and respect every single person who we've lost. 47,173 people in the United States alone took their lives in 2017. 129 people a day, one person almost every 10 minutes. And it's not some problem out there, right? It's, it's here. On Thursday, a uh, high school student at North Atlanta High School, where we meet, took their life. The conversation for me of bringing suicide to the forefront started with a middle school kid at Passion Camp two summers ago who came to Passion Camp having written a letter goodbye to his family on his computer. The student didn't know that his parent had found the letter, and there they were at camp together not having had that conversation yet. And God spoke about suicide at Passion Camp two summers ago, and that student stood up in the response and said, that is me thinking about taking my life. And the parent and the student had a conversation, and light came into the darkness. And this past summer, that same student was also at Passion Camp a year later, and that family is seeing light come into darkness. That stirred something in me, and in Colorado, a few weeks after, I was at an event of 4,000 teenagers, and since the Lord put someone on my heart, I came after my message during the responsive worship. I I, I just asked the worship leader I need to share. I said, I believe there's somebody here who's already made a plan. I believe you've written in your journal, and it's in your drawer in your bedroom right now, and you've already made a specific plan to take your life on a specific day after this Christian conference is over, and if that's you, I just need you to know you're not the only person who's read that journal entry. Jesus has also read every word of that journal entry. And he is here tonight. And he wants to bring light into your darkness. And he wants you to know that he loves you and he is with you and he is for you. And you've got the power to step toward Jesus tonight. And I said, I want to pray for you if that is you. I said, I know it's a bold step and I've never done anything quite like this before. There's 4,000 of us standing around. But if that's you, I just want to invite you, please, can you just put your hand up and let me see it because I want to pray for you in Jesus' name. And I would say in the next second, about 200 hands went up in the room. It took my breath away. But I knew in that moment, Jesus is wanting to step into the conversation. He's wanting to step into the fight. He's wanting to step towards people who are thinking about giving up on it all. 
And not long after, I got pinged on social media by someone who said, if anybody ever asks you, and trust me, I already know the story. I know who does what in, in the circumstances and situations of life. But someone pinged me on social media and said, if anyone ever asked you if you've saved someone's life, you can say yes, because I was in that gathering in Colorado, and I had had a journal entry, and I already had a day and a plan three days after that conference ended to take my life, but I did make that choice because in that night, God shifted my heart and I stepped toward Jesus, and I've chosen to live and not die. The freaky part of it was when I clicked on the link of the person because I was intrigued, it was exactly the face of the person that God had laid on my heart when I stepped up that night. I didn't say it in the setting because you never can trust really if this is me or this is the Lord. You just kind of go with an instinct. And I said, I believe there's somebody here. But it was the girl that God had put on my heart. A cheerleader at her school. One of the bright ones. And I'm sure running with all the right people. But yet dying on the inside. It's all around us. All ages high school kids and CEOs. And the culture is trying to speak in, but honestly, I'm not sure what the arts can bring. It's not a knock on the arts. I love the arts. But 13 reasons why, I don't know if it's really bringing a solution to the struggle. In more recent days, The jury is out on whether Joker is really helping the conversation. But I do know this. I know that we know the one who is the light of the world. Therefore, the church can't be silent. And on the sideline, the church has to speak up. And the church has to talk about mental illness. And the church has to talk about suicide. And that's why we're talking about it tonight. I hope that by speaking up about it, we can destigmatize mental illness and even destigmatize the struggle with suicide. Could it be possible the church could become a place where people could walk in and comfortably say, I'm depressed, I'm on medication, I'm in a treatment facility right now, I've been struggling with thoughts of taking my own life, I actually attempted to take my life, and the church wouldn't reel from that conversation, the church would just lean in with open arms and say, welcome home, there's no stigma here for having mental illness, there's no stigma here for struggling, there's no stigma here for anything that anybody's going through, everybody's welcome in this place, because I'll tell you, being depressed is a weight, but feeling like you can't be honest about where you are, that is a way bigger weight. The pressure to be, quote, unquote, okay is a heavy pressure, and sometimes that pressure is greatest in the church. Why in the church? Well, it's simple. We are faith community and our faith is supposed to be stronger than all these things in the world. Our story is one of victory. Our songs are one of victory. So when you come through the door and you're not walking in victory, when you come through the door and you're actually drowning under the darkness and feel like you're losing your mind, when you come through the door and everybody's got their hands in the air and their journals out and they're amening the message and you don't feel anything, that's a weight, especially if the church puts you in a position where you don't feel like you can be honest. It's the church, in large part, that's been teaching people that suicide is the unpardonable sin. Talk about a stigma. The scripture does not teach that suicide, by the way, is the unpardonable sin. The gospels say clearly that the unpardonable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which in the context of scripture means repeatedly saying to the Spirit of God wooing you to Jesus as Savior and Lord that you're not interested. And to do that over the course of a lifetime is to leave you no recourse with a holy God. There is no way for you to make it into God's future for your life if you resist the Holy Spirit's invitation to come to Jesus. But I don't believe suicide, the Bible is taught, is the unpardonable sin. I do believe suicide in the context of Scripture is a sin. But we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I believe for the believer, suicide is under the blood of Jesus. Even suicide is under the blood 
of Jesus. But in the church, we ask all these questions, right? So easy. Isn't faith enough? Shouldn't faith be enough? You're a Christian. Shouldn't you overcome depression and your struggle and mental illness? Even the church is struggling with, should people be on medication? Should people see a therapist? Should people be in counseling? Should people be in a treatment facility? Well, I, I believe the message of the church needs to be clear and it's not simply we all should pray more. I mean, can I get one amen that somebody's been around faith long enough that it's not that simple for everybody? And everybody doesn't get instantly healed every single time there's an opportunity for healing. I mean, stay with the thought tonight because we're definitely not finished yet, but we've got to create an atmosphere where there isn't a stigma on somebody's life just because they didn't get over whatever they're struggling with during the gathering tonight. I mean, we had great worship and we had amazing stories and we had a, a really good word from the Lord and surely now at the response time, you can get over whatever it is you're dealing with while all the rest of us in the church aren't all fully over all the things we're dealing with. And I believe when we get real, then that stigma comes down. I believe the church needs to clearly say it's okay to not be okay. And I will add to this, if you need help tonight, get help. If you need a doctor, get help. Doctors are gifts from God. Amen. They can be a part of God's plan. All plans that bring healing are God's plans for healing. Any healing that happens in a person's life ultimately must be the result of God because every good and perfect gift comes down from heaven, from the Father of lights. And I just say if you need help, please get help. And to the church, I just want to say to our church, I love our church. We heard stories tonight about people walking into our church from every corner of the neighborhood in all kinds of circumstances and situations. And I just praise God that when they came through the doors of this church, they didn't feel shame and they didn't feel judged and they didn't feel like they needed to cover up their reality, but they could be true and find Jesus and find healing and find help. We gotta make sure we don't put up the church veneer and we've gotta make sure that we don't forget where we came from and what we came through. I know when I realize I'm coming out of the darkness, when I realize I'm coming back to life, when I realize finally I'm gonna make it out of that hole and back into my right mind, I had a choice. I could close the door on that and never talk about it. That's the choice I wanted to make as a man particularly and as a human human being. But then I realized I had a stewardship of a story of a miracle of God's grace and somebody needed the story of the miracle of God's grace that I'd experienced in my life so that they could know they're going to experience that in their life. And I'm not the only one, even those of us moving on in our relationship with God. We all have defeat in our story, right? We all have overcome something. We all have come through something. The worst thing we can do is get through it all and then act like we never went through it all so that we can tell everybody else, you need to get it all together while we're still working on getting it together ourselves. The church has got to be honest and the church has got to be real. And when we do that, I think the stigma is lifted because the last thing the world needs is a fake church. And if you just dropped in tonight and you're not a part of church and you're not really even sure where you are with Jesus, I want you to know something about Jesus. Jesus is not like that. He is not into veneer. And he's not fake. In fact, he said, I've come to heal the sick. He said, the well, they don't need me, but I've come to heal the sick. I've come to seek and to save those who are lost. So if you're good, guess what? You're never going to get a miracle from God. If everything's okay, you are never going to experience the transformation of the resurrection of Jesus. 
It's when we are honest with where we are, who we are, what we are, where we've come from, that we are candidates to experience the power of Almighty God. Jesus is here right now, and he's here to heal. He's here to save. He's here to create a culture. And I just want to say, I just want to take one more step and say that we've got to give people time and space to heal. It's a process. Restoration sometimes takes time. Now, can Jesus do a miracle right here and right now? 100% yes. And it's very likely that he will. Because we've been on our knees today praying that God would do a miracle in this moment right now. We come through the door every week with expectation, and we see God do miracles in every gathering that we have at Passion City Church. And I fully believe he's going to do a miracle right here and right now. There is no doubt in my mind about that. But at the same time, we want to come understanding that sometimes the miracle takes a moment. And for you, the miracle may be that you make it till tomorrow. That may be the miracle, not that all of a sudden, instantaneously, everything went away. The miracle, just as big a miracle for you, may be that I made it to Monday. Praise God, I experienced a miracle. Oh, did everything go away? No, but I'm still here, and I'm still standing, and that's a big miracle of God in my life. It's in the process. So if that's where you are, it's okay to not be okay, amen? We see you, we hear you, we are here for you, we love you, and on top of that, we are you. And we have a place for you. So we've got to destigmatize. I think that'll happen the more we talk about suicide, the more we talk about mental illness, but we've also got to deglamorize suicide. That this is the tougher part of our journey tonight. You say, well, how could suicide be glamorous? Well, the enemy has a way of making everything horrible glamorous. In two specific ways suicide is glamorous is somehow the culture has created an insidious whirlwind. It's called suicide contagion by the scientist. So Robin Williams takes his life, and in the four months that follow that, the suicide rate in America goes up 10%. The manner of suicide in which he died goes up 30 plus percent. Marilyn Monroe takes her life, the suicide rate in America goes up 12%. Somehow, in some crazy way, the media attention and all the notoriety and even the way for some suicide has a cult effect on their legacy. It creates a vortex that sucks people in and pulls them under to this glamour somehow that suicide is actually and can be somehow a good thing. The other way the enemy glamorizes suicide is by telling us that everyone else is going to be better off when we're gone. Kurt Cobain wrote a long goodbye letter at the end of it in two sentences. He wrote to his wife, Courtney, these words. He said, please keep going, Courtney, for Francis. That was their daughter. For her life, which will be so much happier without me. That's the glamorizing power of suicide. My daughter's life will be better without me. I wonder if Francis's life has been better without her father. I can't answer that. Only she can. But I can tell you that it's most likely It is not going to be better for you or anyone else if you take your life. It's not going to be better for you because it's not God's purpose and it's not God's plan for you. Your destiny is not in leaving. Your destiny is in staying. And it's certainly not going to be better for the people that you love. You may be free from your earthly pain. But you're going to trap all those around you in a different kind of pain for the rest of their lives. So don't believe the lie that you're a burden, that one choice can allow you to escape all your pain, and that when you make that choice, 
everyone else will be better off without you. Because that is not the case. No one will be better off without you. Those you love will be left behind to live out their lives with guilt, with a cloud, with self-doubt, with questions, with pain, and with anger for the rest of their lives. And all the while, they'll know that they weren't worth fighting for. Oh, they'll know that it wasn't you that took your life. They'll know that it was the darkness ravaging you, that it wasn't really you thinking clearly. They'll know that intellectually. But it will be a gut punch in their soul. And it will be agonizing. And it will be painful. I met this couple recently in a young couple, he was a young, is a young pastor and he had just gotten out of a, a mental hospital and he'd survived an attempt on his life and he came to tell me how um, something that I had written had saved his life and he said, thank you so much, your words changed my life, saved my life and we hugged and embraced and he cried and I cried and I told him how glad he wa I was that he was alive and he told me how glad he was that he was alive and I told him what a great gift of God it was that he was still here. And the more we talked, the more I realized that it seemed like his wife was completely, you know, in the periphery of the conversation. And it was all about me and God saved me and this change happened in me and I'm here and I'm not gone and I'm still here and all this conversation. And finally, I started realizing there's, there's another person in the story, you know. And so I said to him, I said, you know, I don't know you very well and I want to say this as gently as I can. And I know you just got out of the hospital and I know that you're in a very fragile place. So I'm going to say this as kindly as I can, but you realize that your wife is standing right here also. So I just want to say out loud because it needs to be said, I'm really glad that you're still here. And I'm also equally glad that she doesn't have to live her entire life regretting that she could have done more. Wow. And his eyes widened, and I knew when they did that those thoughts had never fully settled in his heart. He had never fully factored in the collateral of the decision that he was going to make. And I believe that God wants you to hear that tonight. Somebody he wants you to hear that tonight as gently as this house can say it, as kindly as this house can say it. I want you to hear this tonight. Suicide doesn't alleviate pain. It multiplies it. So stay, even in the pain. And trust God to do a miracle and give you another sunrise in another day to believe in him. We need to talk about it, destigmatize it, hopefully, de-glamorize it, and coming down to the end here, we need a better mantra. It can't just be it's okay to not be okay. That cannot be our mantra. It is okay to not be okay. We should be able to say that in the church, but that cannot be the total message, right? Because there's resurrection in our story. That's why we are pointing people to Jesus tonight and fixing our eyes on Jesus. Because even though we may not be okay, Jesus is okay. He is a victor with scars and he has overcome and he is here in this place right now. He understands what's going on. Do you know Jesus was tempted to take his life? You know this, right? In the wilderness, the enemy said, jump off the corner of the temple, angels will grab you. How did he know angels would grab him? 
He'd been 40 days and 40 nights without food and without water in the wilderness. How did Jesus think clearly in that moment? What kind of pressure was he under? What kind of stress was he dealing with? And in a weak moment, the enemy said, jump off the highest point of the temple. Don't worry. It'll all work out. What if he had jumped? And what if angels hadn't intervened? And what if the resurrection plan of Jesus had died that night? So when it says he's been tempted in every way like we are, it means in every way. Yeah. Yet somehow Jesus, knowing he was going through pain, suffering, hardship, death, grave, sin, and hell, he kept talking about not all that he was going to go through. He kept talking about the fact that when he went through it, he was going to come out on the other side, and he did. When Jesus was dying on a cross, one of his closest friends was committing suicide. So don't think that Jesus doesn't understand where we are. He's in the midst tonight, alive from the dead, having come through the darkness, and he's okay. Therefore, you can say, and I can say, that even though I'm not okay, Jesus is okay. I can say, I'm not 100% okay right now, but I want to add to that, Jesus is 100% okay right now. I can say, I feel like I'm losing my mind right now, but I want to add, Jesus is not losing his mind right now. We're not saying some little slogan, just say it with me, I'm not okay, but Jesus is okay, and oh boy, everything just turned out swell. No, we're not saying that. We're saying something more powerful than that. We're saying that you and I can participate in our own future by confessing things that are true over our lives, because in large part, our words determine our destiny. If you're saying all day long, I'm not going to make it, 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 I don't think I'm going to make it, I don't think I'm going to make it, guess what? You're upping your odds of not making it. And you're also mimicking the enemy, because your father's not telling you that. But on the contrary, if you were to say, this is the hardest thing I've ever been through. Anybody in that spot right now? This is the hardest thing I've been through, but I will come out the other side. I'm just going to finish the sentence for myself. There's a counterweight to the weight. The weight is real. The depression is real. The, the situation is real. It's all real, but there's a counterweight to this real, and the counterweight is just as real. He is real, and he's okay. So I'm going to finish the sentence. I am going through the hardest thing, the darkest night, the biggest trial. I am up against hell itself, but I will come through. I'm going to finish the sentence about my own destiny. If I don't see it or I don't believe it, I am still going to speak it because Jesus is, in fact, alive from the dead and has overcome the darkness, and he is okay. And you say, well, what difference does it make? I'm telling you, confessing and bringing Jesus into the darkness gives a little glimmer of light that comes crashing into the blackout of depression. And that one ray of light can bring you another day of life. Oh, I know this is true. I've been there. And I know that you can be broken down to the bottom and still confess that Jesus is a healer at the same time. And the two things don't have to match and be congruent in time and space to be real. Circumstances never corroborate fully the faithfulness of God. You can't trust circumstances to fully corroborate the faithfulness of God. Sometimes circumstances are opposite everything we come to believe about God. But the cross does corroborate the faithfulness of God, and it stands in history as proof that our God is good even in the darkest night. And you can believe that about God even when you're broken down in your weakest state. Both things can live together. And when you start confessing the reality of who he is, things change 
light comes in. So I want to encourage you to use the power of your mouth. You're like, I, I can't. Well, you are. Man, my depression's horrible. My depression's worse than it's ever been. My anxiety is like so bad, I can't even go out of the house. My situation right now, I don't even know if I'm going to come out of this. I've never been this bad off before. I don't, no one has been able to help me. Nobody's been able to solve this. Nobody's been able to diagnose this. I can't see a future. Things haven't changed. It's been like this for a long time. We're already, I'm saying this kindly, using our mouths. Why not just finish the sentence? I mean, I've never been this bad off. I, nothing's changed in three weeks, but Jesus, he's still okay. He's still solid. He's still true. He's still got his right mind. He's still strong. He's still a healer. He still loves me. He's still got some kind of plan. I know it's never been this bad before, but Jesus is still as good as he's ever been since the day he gave his life for me on a cross. I believe it. I believe it, and I'm going to keep confessing it. I'm going to keep saying it, and I'm going to say what the psalmist said. This is the one text and the heart text of everything today. I'm going to confess Psalm 118, verse 17. I will not die, but live, and I will declare what the Lord has done. I will not die, but I will live, and I will declare what the Lord has done. It's not a simple fix. You may need help. I say if you need help, get help. But while you're getting help, use the power of your own tongue to create a future that you're going to live in. And that future is, I'm not going to die. I know it feels like I'm going to die, but I'm not going to die. I'm going to live. And I'm going to have a story to tell of the faithfulness of God in my life. I'm not going to close it up in a closet. I'm not going to hide it behind my Christian church veneer. I'm going to tell the world the whole time. That's where I was, but this is where I am. That's what I was, but God brought me through. I was so far down, but God lifted me up and he brought me out again. I will not die, but I will live and I will declare what the Lord has done. I'm not okay, but Jesus is. That's my story. And every time I say it, I'm bringing Jesus right into the darkness, right into the psych ward, right into the situation, right into the depression, right into the voice of the darkness that is saying, take your life tonight. I'm saying, I got another voice. Jesus is okay. My God is okay. My God is okay. I'm not okay, but my God, he is okay. His name is Jesus. I'll say lastly, that the church needs to create a story whereby we can realize and understand that God might not take all the pain away on this earth. So many people that are contemplating taking their lives, the the, the sentence that they say to me is, I can't take the pain one more day. And somehow I think the church doesn't have an answer to that, except just pray more or believe more or have more faith or get over it or... When the church needs to have an answer to that, and I believe the church's answer to that is, it may not be that you need to pray that God would alleviate the pain. It may be that you need to say to Jesus, you understand pain more than anybody who's ever understood pain. So can I bring this pain to you one more day and trust that you can use the pain to bring about eternal good and eternal change through my life and the lives of other people? Maybe the church needs to say, instead of pray this quick prayer and all the pain will go away, to say, take the pain to Jesus and find that there is purpose in the pain. There was purpose in Jesus' pain. And you say, yes, it was for our healing. And we're all going to stand in that, in that moment where he will wipe away all tears from our eyes, and there is no more sorrow. That's not on this earth. And there is no more death. That's not on this earth. And there is no more crying. That's not on this earth. And there are no more tears. That's not on this earth. That is in forever and our forever home with Jesus. On this earth, there's going to be pain. But the pain can have a glorious purpose. You're like, you don't know what I've been through. I don't. 
but I know what he went through. And he can come alongside you and he can carry you and your pain one more day so that he can use you and your pain to unlock doors for prisoners and set captives free. See, at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus. Suicide is the ultimate rebuttal to the belief that I am created by and for God's glory. Because when you choose to end your life, you cannot glorify God in that way. You glorify God by staying in it and leaning on him to bring you through one more, one more day, one more dawn. That's how God gets glory in our lives. And we were created by and for his glory. So if you need help, get help. But I want to encourage you to stay. Stay for your family. Stay for your friends. Stay for the church. We need you. Stay for the world. You have a gift, and we need your gift. Stay for the world. You have something to contribute to make this world a better place, and we need that. But ultimately, stay for more than your kids. Stay for more than your wife. Stay for more than your husband. Stay for more than your job. Stay for God and his glory. Stay another day so that you can bring glory to God. Don't leave. Stay. You have more power than the enemy wants to make you think that you have. Man, I, I didn't think I had a shred of power. I couldn't go to work. I couldn't go to meetings. I couldn't leave the house. I couldn't function. I couldn't think. I couldn't get out of the bed half the time. And the enemy made me think, you've got no power. But on the night of nights, when my story started turning around, I realized I did have power. I had power to praise God in the darkest place I'd ever been in. And when I did, I just shoved it right back in the face of the enemy. I don't say that like with a big boat up frame because I still struggle sometimes with anxiety. Released a book about overcoming some of my giants and while I set out across the nation on the media tour to talk to people on TV and the radio and in print all about Goliath must fall, I was going under with an anxiety situation that I hadn't experienced in years. Hi, I'm Louis Giglio. This is my new book, Goliath Must Fall. This talks about how the giant of fear goes down. And then I would go back to my hotel room and I was under the gun. Boy, that was fun. But it didn't invalidate the message of Jesus. Because at least I wrote a book. (laughs) That's more than I thought I could have done when I was down in that hole. When I couldn't go to the dinner table. See, the enemy is making you think right now that you have far less power than you have. And you're going to show him tonight, not by some big strong man move or some big superwoman move. You're going to show him just by simply opening your mouth and saying, I'm not okay. Thank you for giving me that line. I accept it. And I am going through a difficult time. That is reality. And I'm not going to glaze over it. But I'm going to say something else tonight. My Jesus, he's okay. I'm not all shouty and crazy and hands up in the air and I'm not doing a little jig and dancing around and it's all I can do to get that out, but I'm getting it out. I'm finishing my sentence. By the grace of God, I will make it. I will not die. I will live and I will declare what the Lord has done. You have the power, more power than you think. You have the power to open this book. And you should. But I'm seeing a good counselor. Amen. I need medication right now and it's helping me. Great. You got the power unless somehow you've lost the use of your arm. Both of them. And your tongue. And you have no friends. You have the power to open this word. And I encourage you to open it starting tonight. Oh, where would I open it? Romans 8. Opens with no condemnation, ends with no separation. And in between, in between no condemnation and no separation, in all things, God works. He works in the psych ward. 
He works in the pit. He works through depression. He works through thoughts of suicide. He works even when a family member has taken their life. God still somehow even works in that. In all things, God works. In between, no condemnation and no separation. You're an adopted daughter, an adopted son of the Almighty God. And the Spirit of God inside of you says, Abba, Father, I have a daddy who loves me. I have a God who cares for me. I have a king in heaven who calls me love son, love daughter. No condemnation, no separation. Why not memorize that? Why not make that the story? Why not hone in on the truth of the last few verses where it says, Nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ, not life or death. Do you hear that? Not life or death. Not life or death. If you're thinking about taking your life, it's not death you're worried about. It's life that's giving you trouble. And he's saying life nor death can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You've got more power than you think you do tonight. I'm not asking you to do gymnastics. I'm just asking you, encouraging you to open your mouth and agree with God. My God loves me even in this pit and he is with me in the middle of it all. If I lean hard on Jesus, I'm going to see another sunrise. And if I bring my pain to him, he will carry me through one more day. And somehow he will triumph over it all because God is greater.